Body shape, BMI. Body shape, BMI. Yeah. So the, this, this is uh, in a Western context, quite low BMIs are attractive to men, right? I'm not denying that at all, right? Uh, for the most part, in in a, and in an industrialized context, generally, right, among wealthy groups of people, right, or historically wealthy, where where starvation isn't a problem. Yeah, there there's there's a lot of evidence that men prefer lighter body weights, right? But if you take a more broad view. It doesn't, this is not, and this is, this is going to get into some of the reservations I have about just jumping to EvPsych as the tool to use because people have come up with these EvPsych theories for like why women, why, why thinner women are, you know, a better choice. And then it's like, okay, well, we didn't evolve in like a modern Western media, uh, hyper wealthy, at least historically unlimited food at the grocery store down the street situation, right? We evolved in a pretty you know, probably unstable, probably relatively scarce environment. Or can we at least say that? And so if you look at, you know, more traditional societies, oftentimes, oftentimes plumper is better, right? Where it's literally women with more body fat are considered sexier, right? And Presumably is, up to a limit. Yeah, but you'd be shocked. I mean, if you look at, for example, uh, and this isn't this isn't necessarily a more traditional society. It's just a society that historically has dealt with more resource scarcity than urban Japan. But if you look at, say, the South African Zulu, you'll consistently find BMIs of up to thirty eight being considered very attractive. And in, and in the West, we'd be like, that is a that's a very heavy person, right? Just frankly, right. So what what's going on there? Well, one thing to notice first is that. Tons of women's tons of women's evolved sexual signaling is conspicuous fat deposits, right? So we're the only primate that has year-round fat deposits on the breasts, right? For example, uh, we have conspicu conspicuous fat deposits on the buttocks as well, especially in women, right? And on the hips, right? So fat, to an extent, in women is clearly works as a sexual signal, right? There's something desirable there. And it seems that, right, in a, in a within in a within cultures context, there's some evidence that within cultures, at least, people who are enduring more stress and scarcity tend to opt for heavier mates. Right, men tend to opt for heavier women, and those who are in a period of abundance, right, they they they've got lots of resource resources, tend to opt for relatively lighter mates. Another piece of evidence for this, right, can be found. So that's within cultures cross sectionally. We can also see this evidence across time, right? For example, American Playboy centerfolds, right? They become heavier when the economy goes down, and they become lighter when the economy goes You're up. You're kidding me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that 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 that's a real result, and I'll send you the PDF. Another. another what's the before you get into that? What's yeah. the proposed mechanism? What do you think's going on to to make? Oh, this excuse good? me. I should have I should have set up front. Imagine you're in an environment where calories are either absent or unstable, right? So you're in a situation where it's like, I don't know, either I don't have food right now, or I don't know if I'm going to have food next month. Your brain is trying to determine who you should mate with. It's doing, it's doing calculations behind the scenes saying whose mate value in this socio-ecological context is desirable. And so the theory, right? And this, this certainly isn't my theory. I'm, I'm, I'm not presenting it as such. But the theory from this tradition of research, the, the environmental security hypothesis, proposes that, and there's convergent forms of evidence, which we'll discuss and already have discussed during sense, proposes that if you're in that situation, it's like, okay, well, who's going to be fertile if there's a famine or who's going to be fertile during a famine, right? Who's going, who is able to obtain calories, right? So women engage in tons of caloric acquisition in traditional environments oftentimes more than the men in fact despite you know western conceptions of this and so because they're doing you know they're they're gathering tubers and to an extent engaged in hunting as well but mostly gathering right gathering fruits nuts berries all the stereotypical things and so you're looking around you're in the situation where you're literally hungry and it's like who's who's sexy right now and then a woman who is clearly advertising that she can obtain calories, survive a famine, and stay fertile, right, during periods of scarcity, right, because low body fat is associated with infertility after a point, mm. right? It's it's an incredible suppressant. Well, that that woman is going to be more attractive than the woman who looks like if anything goes wrong, uh, she's going to die, right? Now, in a Western context where you're not necessarily thinking that, right, where that's that's not 
an issue, well, then you might be concerned with things like status, right? Signaling that like you can afford to go to the gym, that sort of thing. Then you're going to be concerned with things like youth, right? Having, you know, youth and let's say nulliparity, right? The state of not having had kids yet, right? Which is signaled by an incredibly svelte body, right? And so maybe it makes sense in a resource abundant context to prefer that. But in a resource scarce context, which is where most of our evolved psychology occurred, uh, we see we see the we see that he- heavier mates seem to be preferred. Now the evidence for this, and I'll, I'll just recap very very quickly. Within cultures, it seems that those who are you know on the on the lower end of things, resources wise, tend to prefer heavier mates. Across time, right, it seems that the media that men consume of you know pornographic media, the women get heavier when things are going poorly economically, and they get lighter when things are going well. So that's across time within cultures. Now let's talk about within individuals. There's a very funny study where they literally, they showed up at the university dining hall and it's a genius study to be honest. And they're like, okay, you guys are about to have dinner. Which of these, you know, what do you, what do you think? What, what weight do you think is sexiest? What body type do you think is sexiest? And they found that before dinner, the men preferred heavier mates than after dinner, right? So now we've got within persons evidence, within cultures evidence, and across time evidence. And then we've got this very, you know, we, we talked about flashy theories that that do well. We've got a great story as well. Uh, so you were asking about BMI and its attractiveness in women. Yes, it, it's true that in, you know, a, 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 a Western context and maybe broadly in an industrialized context, this, this is more attractive, but that doesn't mean that that's the default state of our species. And, you know, Plenty of men prefer women with uh, with more curvaceous figures. I mean, I I honestly I remember. Um, I think did, did you recently have Jordan Peterson on? Yes, right? I'm remembering correctly. Yep. I remember when he you know had the gall to tweet not attractive with the picture of the plus size model who has a hip to waist ratio, a waist to hip ratio of like 0.7, an incredibly feminine, symmetrical, average face, and it's like. Maybe not to you, but to most men throughout history, that would be one of the highest mate value women that they'd ever encountered. If we, if we entered a recession next week, then it might get a little bit more. She might be a little bit more attractive. Yeah, to I everybody. mean, and I think that she, she, all, I mean, not speaking about any specific women, uh, you know, that, that that's certainly not. It's not it's certainly not my style to talk to comment on like specific women's bodies, but like it was one of those glaring examples where it's like, okay, well, you know, Doctor Peterson, you're clearly not aware of this literature. Yeah. So couple of interesting things. First off, is there a name for this? Is it like the economic mediation of female BMI yeah. hypothesis? So or something? I've heard it called the environmental security hypothesis. Uh, but it, you know, the last, it, it, it started getting research on it about 20 years ago. Then, you know, it just, they just hit a few home runs and then it was like, okay, this seems to be true. All right. Um, but again, it's this is the difference between behavioral ecology and evolutionary psychology is that evolutionary psychology, if you read one of their literature reviews on thinness, you'll just read about how, you know, not, to, you know, I'm not trying to character anybody, but you'll often read stuff about just why thinness, is, our psychology evolved for thinness. And then if you read someone from a more behavioral ecology standpoint, it's like, well, in as much as we have a default state, it seems to be towards, you know, slightly heavier right than is current um, but we don't really have a default state it's flexible based on the environment and uh and that's yeah i'd say that's that's pretty tied up with a bow in other news this episode is brought to you by element stop having coffee first thing in the morning your adenosine system that caffeine acts on isn't even active for the first 90 minutes of the day but your adrenal system is and salt acts on your adrenal system. Element contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio of sodium, potassium, and magnesium that helps to curb cravings, regulate your appetite, and improve your brain function. There's a reason that I continue harping on about Element. It's a product I've used for over three years. Every single morning that I wake up, whether I'm on the road or at home, I start my day by having one of these in water because it really does help. It tastes phenomenal. It's got no sugar in it, no gluten, no fillers, no other artificial junk or BS, and it really makes me feel fantastic. Best of all, there's a no BS, no questions asked refund policy with an unlimited duration, so you can buy it right now, completely risk-free, and if you do not like it for any reason, they will give you your money back, and you don't even need to return the box. That's how confident they are that you'll love it. Right now, you can get a free sample pack of all eight flavors by going to the link in the description below or heading to drinklmnt.com slash modernwisdom. That's drinklmnt.com slash modernwisdom. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that clip, you will love the full-length episode, which you can watch right here. Go on. 
Press it.